<coughs> Thank you. So you have the same opinion as me, as my all my students. You, you <laughs> don't like me much, but <laughs> <coughs> thank you, thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, yeah, so I'm. Huh? Yeah, that's probably on Google. That's true. <laughs> 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 uh, so I am. Um, I'm from the University of Sao Paulo, I'm, but I'm on a sabbatical visiting Rutgers University. So I'm not coming all the way from Sao Paulo to hear me. <laughs> Uh, so, what I'm going to talk about today is this work I'm doing with Constantine and Sean Harker at Rutgers. And um, so, it's some ongoing work that we're trying to study, I mean, uh, study protein folding or understand protein folding using persistent homology. So, um, so let's, um, let me try to <coughs> describe a little bit what pro protein folding is. So, the, pr the protein, protein for it to function properly, it needs to be folded in the proper three-dimensional structure. So in this three-dimensional stru structure of the protein is called the native state of the protein. Um, and this proper na native state, proper three-dimensional shape is essential for the function of the protein. If the protein is not folded in the proper shape, then it's not gonna function properly. So it's essential that when the protein is folded, it folds correctly to the correct three-dimensional shape. And um, this is, um, is believed this model that this thing is, is, is driven by this energy functional. So you have an energy functional that if you minimize this energy functional, then the, the minimum will give you the proper folding of the protein. So it's um, very, so when you have this chain of amino acids, like a linear chain of amino acids to, the, to, to decide how this is gonna fold. So it's a very challenging uh, problem to try to, <coughs> try to understand uh, or predict the protein for the proper three-dimensional shape of the protein directly from this chain of amino acid. And, um, and also protein stability that is related to protein folding. It's a the two, two very challenging problem. And um, we're gonna talk about protein folding this, uh, in, in this talk. And um, so this is, um, kind of the, the data set or the problem we're gonna talk uh, here is from uh, like protein design or so if you try to, to in the computer simulate if you give the chain of amino acids and try to simulate what would be the, the protein folding the, the proper folded structure by minimizing some energy functional so this is computer simulated data um, so the the data that we're analyzing is, is by Sagar Kar Kare from um, lab at Rutgers, so he's a chemist and they do these simulations. So, and the, the computations, the minimization of the energy function are do he's using two software packages, Rosette and Ember. Those are two software packages that uh, have all the information about this uh, energy functionals of the protein. So you give this uh, software the chain of amino acids and I, I guess you can give some initial shape or you can just give the linear chain of amino acids and this software will try to minimize the energy and will give you the final structure that it found after minimizing the energy. And um, when you run these this computations, like when they do these computations, they, they are trying to simulate um, proteins that they have the, the correct uh, native protein from, from PDB. So then they can try to compare the result from the simulation with the, the true protein with the correct protein and they, they could compute this uh, um, mean square deviation, RMSD. And uh, so this is a measure of the error that you have in the, in the predicted folder, in the, in the pre predicted structure compared with the, the native, the true structure. Right? Uh, and when they do this, many of the computations um, produce um, configuration that um, the minimum energy is not um, if it is not, it's not very small, right? So it, and this is probably because in your energy function there are lots of local minima. So if your, if your simulation gets stuck in some local minima, then you're gonna fail to, to produce a, a very low energy value. So the, the simulation stops at some, probably some local minima. When these kind of things happen, when you get this local minima with the high energy value, then you know from the, from the, from the value of the energy that you did not reach an, small energy value, minimal energy, so you know that that's not the correct uh, corrected, uh, prediction. 
Um, the more, I guess, challenging, interesting case is when you get um, predictions that have a small energy value. So you have a minimal energy value, but um, they are not uh, good predictions. So if, when you compare this with the, with the native protein, with the, the true protein, then you get a large error, a lar large RMSD, right? So these are false minima, right? The energy function is telling you have a minimum energy value, but um, if you compare with the true protein, you get a bad prediction, right? And this is kind of the thing that we want to try to understand. So the idea is to try to, to see if we can understand, uh, well, that's the protein folding problem. Uh -huh. So how are you comparing these two 3D shapes? Can you say a bit more about this RMSD, I guess? Yeah, so this is, they are doing that, but so the way they do is you have the, native shape, the true shape, and the predicted shape. And uh, they kind of over, I mean, rotate the entry so that the molecule, the corresponding molecules are corresponding to each other. And then they just compute the distance. It's kind of a distance square of the, of the corresponding molecules, right? So they just try to put the two. But two somehow you have to align them. Right, somehow they have to align them. Okay. So I don't know exactly how they do that. Somehow they align them. And then when they align them, they just compute the distance of individual molecules and the, the distance square or something like that. Individual atoms. Individual atoms, right. The individual atoms in, in the molecule, right. They have to align the atoms so they can compute this distance. So that's how, that's, that's this, this area. So it's like just essentially a mean square, uh, mean root square error, something like that. Right, that's exactly, I guess, the problem. I mean, the, if um, that's, so the, the thing where, when you get this, um, these bad predictions, so then I guess it could be, uh, why do we get these bad predictions? Is it because it's, uh, the energy function is, is bad? Or is it because, I don't know, there, there could be two to distinct the proteins that could um huh? <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so if um if you have um you could have two distinct proteins that live i mean that are possible that are allowed to to, to exist but they did not observe one of them in in real proteins so then the the predicted structure could be Okay, <laughs> could be allowed, but it's, it's, not, it's giving a large error because you did not observe that in the in the in the in nature, right? Or it could be that you have a bad energy functional, right? In some regions of your energy functional, there are there are regions that um, the energy functional is give is giving you something that looks like a minimum, but it's the wrong minimum, right? And um, so if you have um, so the, when proteins are being produced, they are in, by, by the RNA, they are being produced and they are folding themselves as they are being produced, right? So if you have very large, very long proteins, it's, it's um, conceivable that they could, um, if, you, if they start folding as they are being produced, it's conceivable that they fold, they have a preferred way to fold. And, or if you just take the whole sequence of amino acids and let it fold at once, it's conceivable that it could fold in a different way, right? So if you have very large proteins, it's conceivable that you could have two different ways of folding that produces um, correct proteins, right? Correct molecules. Are there any um, proteins in nature that have the same change for that different configuration? Uh, isn't that with prions on it? No, that would be a disaster. Yeah, is a prion, prion is a, is a language it's change. It's a protein in the brain that's folded long, mm -hmm. and it creates lots of... Mm -hmm. Right. My understanding is that uh, there is only one correct. I mean, if if they if fold incorrect, I mean, lots of um, Alzheimer's, if I'm not mistaken, is the problem. Uh, there can be two things that are that are imaging each other, but the distances are all identical. Right? But it's even though they're doing folding, the amino acids. Otherwise, it would work. It would be a disaster. So you want to avoid those. Well, you want to avoid those. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And here, what they are trying to do is synthetic protein design, right? So they want to, if they want to design a protein that does not exist, they need to know that they can predict the correct folding that the protein will function as they intended to function. Mm -hmm. So then, 
um, for so I mean if you if you had very large proteins it, it's conceivable that if, if the energy function is correct you could still fold in different ways even though you don't observe one of them in nature the other one could be correct but the proteins that we analyze are very small proteins they mm -hmm. have around 100 amino acids so for those proteins it's it's our belief it's very unlikely that they will fold in different ways. Probably there is only one way they can fold. So if, if the energy function is correct, our, our, our hypothesis what is that uh, what we believe is that they should fold in only one way. Right? There is only one correct way for the energy fold. So then when we get this, um, these bad predictions, the, the, the minimization gives us something with a, slow, a small uh, energy, but it's, it's, it's a wrong prediction. So then we believe that this is a mistake in the in the energy function, right? For this, that's what we we want to try to to see if this is true, right? So that's what we the hypothesis we want to try to test. Can you give uh, some intuition on how we obtain the energy function? Well, I don't really know exactly, but I think it's um, maybe Constantine knows better. But I think it's um, so they we have all the, the sequence of amino acids, and I think they put lots of information together to, I don't think they have like, a, of course, they don't have a formula for this functional, but they know, they, they know very well this local interaction of these amino acids the, and the, the bond, bonding energy of the amino acids. And they, they know, I think they understand, the chemists understand very well the local interactions of amino acids when things fold. And they, I think they take all these local energies that they understand very well and put them together somehow and make this global energy function. Right? I think that's- I think the, the two packages you have, the one with right. the Somebody had done an experiment once that gave an energy for what happens when you have that kind of correlation. And then the computer program says, whoops, let's use the, mm -hmm. forget about that we ever we estimated, let's go and pull the experiment. Right? Right. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, these are very complicated packages of mixtures of experimental data plus uh, approximation. Are, are any of them proprietary? I'm sure they're all proprietary. So, so no one would even know. Exactly right. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, and I don't think no one, be, I mean, at least people I talk to, they don't believe that these packages, I mean, these energy functionals are, are perfect, right? They know that, that are, they make, that are mistakes there, right? So then, um, so we, let's say, our hypothesis that we, we want to try to test whether it's really, we can find some uh, mistakes in this energy functional. Let's, let's say if this is the problem, that are, there are mistakes in the energy functional, we want to try to see if we can, um, if that's really the case, if we can find some, some information. Some, you can try to identify this, right? Um, and then, as I said, this local energy between the amino acids is well understood. Uh, so then, if there are these mistakes in the energy functional, it, they are likely coming from global global structure in the, in the whole protein, right? Because I, I think it's believed that these local energy are well understood, they are correct, but when you put everything together in the global structure, there could be some global, global information, global structure that is giving you mm, the wrong uh, energy functional. Um, so then we want to try to see, if that's the case, then we, we want to see if we can identify global geometric structure that will maybe give right, right Give, give rise to these uh, imprecisions. And um, so to, to try to understand this global, to see if that is, we can identify this global geometric structures, we are gonna try to use, uh, well, these are here, topology, and more precisely persistence uh, homology. So the idea is to try to use um, persistence homology to try to see if we can identify global geometric structure in the protein that um, possibly give rise to the error. If this is, so as I said, this is something that we are working on, so we don't have um, definitive, result, definitive results about on this. So we have some um, initial computation, some initial indications that things might work, but we don't really have the final results. So. But um, 
if if this is the case, if really things really work out, then this this if we are able to find this um, some some region, some global structures in the in the in the molecules that give rise, then this could gu could help them guide this uh, minimization technique, right? So you could possibly be able to identify where the energy function are, are making errors. And when you're doing your minimization, you, sh you could, could add this to the software package and say, no, here you make errors, so you can try to correct it in some way, right? So that's the, that's the hope, that's the goal of, the, of, the, of this project, right? Uh, so let me try to describe some details of what we are, we are doing. So we are doing, as I said, we are using persistent homology, so I guess we ha have seen I mean, probably don't need to say this here, but, and we have seen homology and persistent homology already, but we're gonna be focusing on this um, Betty numbers, beta one and beta two, and see how these Betty numbers evolve when you have this, these molecules that evolve with, uh, <coughs> with, a, with a parameter. And, uh, well, here's just some example. And here, just some, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, so I, we have seen this before, just one. <laughs> <laughs> so this, long, a long time ago, we were doing some, um, me and Constantine and uh, some other people were studying uh, level sets of uh, solutions of PDEs. In particular, this is Kahnhiller, 3D Kahnhiller. And when we did the simulations in 3D, always the level sets would always give, give us beta zero equals one. <laughs> so, uh, at the time, we did not understand why. You now, I guess we. Now, I guess we do. Yeah, Constantine was also always telling me. <laughs> <laughs> run, run in different parameters and see if we get different things. But always, beta zero was one. So. Um, did you do it in two dimensions? Yeah, we did it in two dimensions. But in two dimensions, then we have. Uh, <laughs> A different story, right? So that's why, right? <laughs> when we went from two dimension three, we <laughs> try truth. Why? Um, so again, Rachel already told us. I mean, what persistent homology is, and I guess everyone here probably knows. But let's quickly go through this. So, um, persistent homology is we're going to have a sequence of um, a filtration a sequence of um, complexes. In your case, you're going to be simplicial complexes. And um, so, and persistent homology gives us, I like to think of it as giving us some kind of metric information about the, the holes in the, in the, in the, um, in, the in your, in your sequence, in your filtration. If, and this is part particularly the case, if you construct your filtration by, by growing balls, right? So by picking balls of center at the points and growing these balls, then the size of the balls will determine when these things are born and disappear. So then in some sense, you get information about the size of your object, right? How they persist tells you some information about the size. Um, and uh, well, there are lots of software packages to compute persistence. We are using this too. And um, so when we compute persistence homology, then we have, we just saw this, but we have we compute this persistence diagrams with just this set of uh, birth and death pairs, right? So each pair represents a, a one L-dimensional hole. And uh, well, we plot them like this, right? The x-axis is the birth time and the, the death, the y-axis is the death time. So just a quick example, if you have this simple um, filtration, then um, initially you have three components, so then these are these three dots over here. They are born both at time one, so time one, two, three, four. At instant, at time one, you have three components, then in time two, one of them disappears. So then this point here indicates that this component appears at one and disappears at two. And then this one dies at three, let me get there. And the final one never dies. So this one is like, lives all, all the way to infinite. And the same thing here in dimension one, we are measuring uh, holes or me measuring loops. There is only one loop that's born at three and dies at four. So we have this point at three, four, right? Um, and um, also, <coughs> we just saw this. So we can also compute the distance between these persistent diagrams, right? So this, in particular, this bottleneck distance. And this, um, if you look at the persistent space with this metric, this uh, persistence map is a continuous map. So it means you have the stability of persistent diagrams. It means if you have a small error in your data, you should get a very close persistent diagram, right? So this is very important for application, right? So you don't want to 
change our data a little bit and get a completely different answer from your persistence, right? And then this, uh, uh, this metric is, like Ray just told us, you just find a bijection between the points. So here you have two person diagrams, one red, one blue, and then you just try to match points. You find this bijection gamma. And then when there is no one to match the point, you match the point with someone on the diagonal. And then you take the soup of this matching, and then you take the info over all possible bijection, right? So it's the best matching. Essentially, you're trying to find the best matching and then try to take the soup of this matching, right? That's the bottleneck distance, so the largest distance you can find here. Um, so now the, the thing we're going to compute persistence with is the proteins. What we have is the, is the location of the atoms of the proteins. So we have a point cloud of points in R3. So when you have a point cloud, how do, we, how do we compute persistence? To compute persistence, we need to build a complex, right? Some kind of complex. And uh, what the complex we're going to use is um, alpha shapes. Um, so the idea of alpha shapes is uh, this idea that you're going to, so the idea is that uh, uh, the protein is, we have this location of the atoms of the protein. The idea is that the model for the protein is the collection of balls, where the radius of each ball is the van der Waals radius, right? But um, we don't know, well, there are in, in the measurement there are imprecisions, so we don't want to pick one fixed uh, size of ball to, to, to model our, our protein. So the idea is you vary the, ra the radius of the ball and you try to model the protein as a collection of balls centered at each one of the atoms, but the radius of these balls are changing, right? So we, 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 we we vary the rates of the balls between some small and large values because this somehow in this range you're going to be able to capture the true protein that are there, right? Since you don't have the exact uh, balls to make the, the model for the protein, right? And one very important property of alpha shapes is that the union of balls and this alpha complex that we get, they have the same homology, right? So then when you construct this, there are other ways you can construct um, um, complexes using growing balls by changing the rates of balls centered at your points, Rips complex, for example. But in the case of Rips complex, you don't get the, you don't get the correct homology for alpha shapes we do. Um, so, but what's alpha shape? So you have a collection of points in Rn. Um, the first thing we do is you take this collection of points and you compute the Voronoi decomposition of Rn. So you write Rn as the union of these Voronoi cells, Vi. Each VI is the Voronoi cell of one point XI. So, and the Voronoi cell VI is the set of points in Rn closest to VI than to all the other points in your, in your data set. Right? So this decomposes Rn into N cells VIs, the Voronoi cells. Right? And if you take the dual of this Voronoi um, decomposition, you get the Delaunay triangulation of your data set. Right? Now to construct, the, to construct the alpha shape, we're going to use this Voronoi decomposition. And um, we take, you observe that the union of the balls is the same as the union of the balls intersect with the Voronoi cell, right? So this thing here, take each ball and intersect with the, with the Voronoi cell corresponding to that ball. And the union of the balls intersect with the Voronoi cells gives the same as the union of the balls. Uh, and these are the balls centered at the Xi and radius R. And then when you take the dual of this, of this um, object, of this union of balls intersection with the Voronoi cells, this is a simplicial complex, this is the, the alpha shape, this is the alpha complex, right? So, but essentially what you're doing is when you have two balls that intersect, we take, the, we, we connect them by an edge. If you have three balls that intersect with no holes in the middle, we put a two dimensional face and in three dimensions, and you can keep doing like this, right? So that's the, the general idea is that. And in, com and in this way, so the alpha shapes, the alpha complex is a subcomplex of the Delaunay triangulation, right? Because you're computing the dual the, the du of the Voronoi decomposition, right? So then, for this reason, it's, it's very efficient to compute it, at least, at least in low dimension, right? So in dimension two, three, or low dimensions, you can efficiently compute uh, alpha shapes. Um, and um, we always get a subcomplex of the Delaunay triangulation of your set of points. And um, th there is this um, thing that I already said that's very important that the union of the balls have the same homology as, the, as your alpha shape. So, right? so then we construct this simplicial, simplicial complex of that uh, have the same homology as the union of balls. Right? So that's the model that you use to compute uh, persistence. Um, so then just um, 
one quick ex example to illustrate. So here I'm denoting the radius by alpha. That's in the name alpha shape comes from the usually the radius denoted by alpha. So if you have a um, smaller radius, you have a uh, the small co the complex corresponds to the smaller radius always contain the next one. And when you increase the radius, so if alpha is very small, close to zero, what you get is just your point set. As you start to increase your radius, then you start to add edges. If you increase more, you start to add two-dimensional faces, and so on, until when your radius is very large, then you get the full uh, Delaunay triangulation of your point cloud. Right? Uh -huh. Are you assuming that all the atoms are identical? Identical. That you don't have hydrogen, carbon. Oh no! So we are. That's the the next thing we're, we're going to say. So we are using um, uh, weighted alpha shapes, right? Because each atom has, um, there are different atoms, so we have the different Van der Waals radius. So we use the Van der Waals radius as the, as the, as the weights for the atoms. So then uh, when you put the weights, the weight, weighted alpha shapes is, um, the idea is the same. The only thing is that now when you use your metric to compute the Voronoi cells, you, you use a weighted metric with this, with this, with this um, Van der Waals radius. Right? So you're using weighted alpha shapes, so then different atoms are weighted differently when you con construct this, uh, this complex, right? And uh, there are very fast software to compute these things in, in low dimension, dimension two and three, for especially that is Seagull, that they have very fast software to compute this uh, alpha, alpha shapes, alpha complex, right? That are, that's, the, that's the package that we are used to compute alpha shapes. Um, and then, so what the, da what the data that we have is, um, is in the format of the PDB, this protein data bank, that, oh, I mean, this is a large collection of uh, protein data that people do experiments and, and put this data in, this data in there. And this data format, always you have, um, for each atom, you have the coordinates of the, the center of the atoms, X, Y, and Z, and you have all the information about errors and things like that. And uh, the very last column is what atom we have, right? Uh, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, and so on, right? So then you can, you can get from here the coordinates of the atoms and what kind of atoms you, are, you have, and then you use the van der Waals radius to, 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 to construct the, the weighted alpha complex. So this way we can, that's, that's how we, that's the data we have, and then we take this data, this is our point cloud, then we compute um, the alpha shapes, the, the alpha complex, and that's our, that's our filtration, that's our complex. And then we can compute um, persistent diagrams. Just uh, one example, if you take this uh, hemoglobin for this PDB ID, so this is just a um, plotting just the, the points, the, the atoms with a very small radius just to, for us to see. And then if you try to compute the, the persistent diagram, so here's, Persistence diagram in dimension one. So we're measuring holes, loops, tunnels in this structure. So, I mean, there are some slightly big hole here. We see this point over here, right? So this is the, the, the diagram. And the way we are, we're gonna plot the persistence diagram, not like this, but we're gonna plot it like this. So the only thing is we're gonna, the X axis is gonna be still birth. And the Y axis, instead of plotting that, we're gonna plot persistence or lifespan, which is that minus birth, right? So then we're gonna plot my persistence diagrams in this way. When you plot them like this, I mean, it's exactly the same information, right? The x-axis gives you the birth and the y-axis for how long they lived, right? So then if you look at this point here, it lived all the way from zero to four, more or less, right? So that's the, this four here will be the radius alpha in which uh, this big loop, big loop was closed in the middle, right? Um, so, and what, what we want to do is, with this, is um, we want to... On the, on the back slide, that hemoglobin, uh -huh. every hemoglobin is just like that, or would you know, there be little variations here and there uh, from one hemoglobin uh, to the next? Well, I think if you, if you take um, the hemoglobin in different uh, living... In the same person. In the same person, I think they should... I mean, I don't know if they're exactly, exactly the same, but they're supposed to be... They would probably be the same. The same. Right, so probably the same, the so same shape. These rings are right, it'll line up exactly to the other one. There won't be some little, oh, this guy here turned that way by accident and got hooked on, on the other I, one. I believe not. I believe it should be always like this, right? Unless there is some. Uh, you know, there's, some there's a certain amount of stochasticity. Right. I think that it's not perfectly the same, but. But it's, wow, okay. But the, the general shape should be the same, mm -hmm. I, I, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you look at across different species if it's still exactly the same or if there is, right, right. 
so, and the, so then what we want to do is for this, for this protein data that we have, we want to, to use this persistence diagram to try to characterize the global shape or the global topology of the, of the protein and see if this uh, can help us somehow identify if, if there are mistakes in the, in the energy functional and see if we can identify the regions where this happened. And what we're going to do is, uh, well, we're going to somehow use um, machine learning, more, more precise linear regression. So <clears throat> the, what we want to, from the persistent diagrams, we want to vectorize it somehow. We want to extract vectors, take the persistent diagram and extract vectors from the, di from the diagram. And there are more than one way to do this. The way we, we are doing is we use this idea of persistence image. And the idea is, the essential idea is for each, so you have your persistence diagram in some dimension. This is a pair of points, birth and persistence. And for each point, we put um, a Gaussian or some, some probability distribution centered at that point. And we sum all these probability distributions and then we weight them by some weight, weighting function. So then here, centered at each persistence um, point, pi, bi, pi, we put a Gaussian, a two-dimensional Gaussian, and then we're weighting by the persistence to, to some power p, right? So this is the height from the, this pi is the height from the x-axis to, to whatever the point is. Uh, so we do this because we want things close to the x-axis to be zero because those are things that are <laughs> not, not important. And if, we're f if, we're, if you have high long persistence, th this, those things are more important. So that's, that's the weighting function that we use. So then with this, we construct this, this function, just two-dimensional function. Then we choose a grid on the xy plane where you believe or you, your, how your protein di persistence diagrams are, your, the important information is. And on this grid, you can um, evaluate the function and then let's say integrate the function on each grid element or more simply just compute the function at the, at the midpoint of each, each grid element. And then you, you're gonna get this vector of values. For each grid element, you have a value. So then you just put these grid elements in, in a vector using some order then somehow and, and make a vector, right? So this way you get a vector of in some Rn, right? So this way you can take your persistence diagram and construct a n-dimensional vector. So you vectorize the diagram. So with this then it's um, much easier to do things like uh, machine learning and or linear regression or other kind of things. And um, just as one example, so if you take this diagram that you had before, so here I chose a coarse grid, so for us to have an idea of what happens. So I pick uh, the interval 0, 10, 0, 6, the same, the same region here. I put a grid over here, and then compute my function. And then I threshold it with um, everything that's less than, I don't remember exactly what I used here, I, this is just to, to illustrate, but everything that's less than, I don't know, 10 to the minus 7, I throw away. So then we get, we are left with this. So this is the persistence image corresponding to this, um, the, just the, the values that we get for the persistence image on this, for this diagram over here, right? And then this is, these are, so the grid points over here, that's where we are gonna get the points, these values and make them into a vector to, to be our persistence vector. And one nice thing is that, as I said before, one very important uh, property of persistence diagram is this stability that it's, it's, the persistence map is continuous. And so if you have errors in your, in your measurements, you're gonna have small difference in your persistence uh, diagrams. And when you do it like this, put these Gaussians, you, can, you, you retain this continuity, you retain this stability. Um, a simpler way to try to vectorize this would be just to put a grid over here and count the points on each grid, but that would be discontinuous. So then putting the Gaussians, the Gaussians at each point makes it uh, continuous, right? And, um, and, then, well, and then this is, I guess, good and bad. We, can, uh, we, we have freedom to choose which region we wanna focus on and what's the resolution of this, uh, the, the grid and what's the, the variance of the Gaussian. All these things are patterns that we need to choose, right? So this is the, this is the vectorization that we do. And then, so now what we do with this, um, with this vectorized persistence diagram. So we, we're gonna do, or let's say the simplest possible machine, machine learning, the simplest possible statistical analysis that we could do is linear regression, right? <clears throat> so we're gonna try to fit um, a, linear, a linear model to this. So this X is gonna be our, our vectorized diagram. So X here represents our, our persistence diagram, uh, Y, 
represents the error that we have the measure for each protein we have this error that uh, compare the, the predicted the structure with the true native st state structure this rmsd error and then we fit this linear linear regression when you do this we con we get this vector w here and the vector w has the same dimension as, as x right so this is a dot product and then this vector w i mean this was is called by hiroka obayashi and hiroka the dual persistence diagram right because or you're solving this, you have this the dual vector over here, right? And there is a vector of the same dimension as the, as the vectorized persistence vector. So you call this the, the dual persistence diagram. And the nice thing about doing this, even though uh, we are doing a, something simple as a linear fit, on the other hand, the whole process is nonlinear because we, we start with the, your data, we do persistence, which is a high, highly nonlinear function. Then at the end, we try to do this linear fitting. So then maybe linear linear fitting works. And the, the nice thing about doing this linear fitting is that for each, we get this dual diagram. So the result of our linear fitting, the result of our learning can be interpreted as a new diagram, right? As, an, as a, this dual persistence diagram. And this may help us when we try to see what the result, the result tells us in terms of the, of, the, of the molecules that we're trying to analyze. Right? And uh, so how this is solved or just the, the standard way, right? So we just solve this, um, mean square error, minimize this mean square error function. And usually these diagrams are very high dimensional. We put a grid of 50 by 50 or 100 by 100, get very high dimensional diagrams. So to, to prevent overfitting or to, to help with the overfitting, we, we, we add, I mean, it's common to add this regularizing term, right? So, and here that I took, we, are, we add this, um, th that is this L2 regularizing term, this lambda, norm of W, right? And um, well, there are two, we're, we're using two regularizing terms. The L2, which is called a, is a standard called the ridge uh, linear fitting. And then we're also using L1, which is the lasso um, linear fitting. Um, so we try to do computation with both of those. And um, so when you do this uh, L2 regularization, this is nice because it's a differentiable function. So you get, um, I guess the, at least the theory, the idea is that maybe the results will be better. On the other hand, when you do L1 uh, regularization, this is, is known to produce um, a sparse learned vector, right? So then we try, to, we, what we want is to get this dual diagram W. And then w when you do this L1 regularization, if you get a sparser vector W, if that gives us useful information, it would be nice because we'll be localizing to some regions. And the, the idea is to, try to, to look back at these regions compared with the, with the diagram, right? Um, so then with, the, with this lasso, with this L1 regularization, we get these sparse persistent diagrams, and this might be useful to identify these regions on the diagram where, where mistakes happen, if, if we can do that. So then, um, so the data set that we're working with is, um, so we have, um, it's not a <laughs> very big data set at the moment that we're co computing with. We have 48 different protein types, for 48 PDB IDs. Right? So 48 different, uh, different molecules that are being simulated. And, um, and the, there are small molecules around 100 amino acids each. Um, and uh, for each one of them, we have this measurement of the error comparing the, the true molecule with the, with the, with the predicted structure. Um, and all these predicted structure are the, so there is, we have data where the, the computations, the result of the computations give um, not very small energy at the minimization, after the, the minimization computations. So those we know that are wrong, so we're not considering those. And the ones we are considering are the ones that have low Energy, energy value, right? So the minimization um, came back and say, this has a low <coughs> energy value, so this should be correct structure. And among those, um, many of them have um, um, large error. So you have this false minima, right? So you have um, a little more than half of them have this false minima. And, and the other ones, they, they, um, they're correct, right? Uh -huh. Types. So, how many proteins did you have all together? 
I mean, is that just is protein type a thing with a protein or is it? Yeah, so so for yeah, actually it's forty three, I think. I, but um, pro so protein type is uh, is a is a protein like a PD, for example, hemoglobin okay. is one protein type. Another one is a, a different uh, type of molecule. And how did you end up with if you have forty eight proteins? How do you end up with two hundred sixty nine false antibodies? No, no, so we have, um, we have um, the data set we have has more than 48 uh, structures. For each protein, they try to predict several times, right? So you have, it's not, it's 43, I think. So you have 43 different structures that they are trying to predict. And for each structure, they try to run several simulations, starting with, I guess, different initial conditions. Or, so then for each structure, for each type, for each PDBID, they have lots of uh, computations. And among those, there are, three types of things that can happen, right? You can have um, the energy functional tells you my final energy value is high, so then those we know it's wrong. Or the energy function, the energy minimization can tell you my energy value, final energy value is, is small. So those are the minimizations telling you it's, 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 it's a correct uh, folding. But when you compare with the true pr protein, with the true protein from PDB, I, I, I guess they compare, then you see that you have a large error. So those are the false minimum. So you have a, False minima and error where the minima apparently works because, I mean, it works because when you compare, you get very small error, right? So how did you get to another minimum by plotting the different traits? Yeah, I guess they start with a different uh, initial condition, right? And then the, our, our hope is to, to be able that when you, when you get this, um, this. How many came out, how many came out correct? Yeah, so we have, um, we are, well, from the date we are considering, we, we're analyzing 400 proteins, so a little more, a little less than half came out correct. 43 proteins. Sorry, 400, um, 500 molecules, 400 structures, 400 pre predictions, configurations. <laughs> configurations. <laughs> right, so in your data set, we have four, 400 uh, configurations, and among these 400, more than half came out wrong. I mean, they have more data, but that's the, the if you're analyzing, it's like, it's, it's not, uh, I think they do, they do better. I mean, better than this. They don't. I don't think they get uh, so many mistakes. But the data we have, the data we are analyzing, I have a little more than half correct. Uh, a little more than half wrong, and a little less than half correct. You have not 43 correct, right? No, I mean for one, for one, for one PDB I did, they may have more than one simulation that worked correct. Right. No, the set is 400 structures. So the, the simulation, this energy minimizations is run, I mean, I have data for 400 runs. Each one of these 400 runs gives me a final predicted structure. But, but I take. The, the chain itself is only 43 different chains, right? No, no, no. So we're trying to, they're trying to model 43 different types of proteins. So one of them is, is, you know, is not, but let's say hemoglobin, the other one is a, right. a different amino acid, a different protein. Correct, no, look, there's 40, 48, right? there's 48 kinds of fruit, and you have 10 different artists painting a picture of those fruit, okay? So you say, paint an apple, and each artist paints a different See? apple, and some, and some paint things that aren't apples at all. <laughs> <laughs> Right, <laughs> many, many wrong <laughs> ranges. I thought that we had established there's only one correct method, but I'm okay now. I right, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so for, for, each, for each type, they have only one from nature, the, the true protein, mm -hmm. that they're comparing with the predictions from the, from the minimization, right? And there's some that have very small <laughs> energies that are essentially the same. Right. right. Okay. So the error that you get when comparing it against the PDB is negligible. Right. So, you know, so that will really I see. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I, I don't know what's the exact value that they say. If the error is less than this, I accept as good or, or not. But for, for a very small error, they accept this as, as a good. Uh, so then, as is the data set we have is 400 uh, persistence diagrams, so meaning 400 <coughs> predicted structure, as I said. And um, so here, I mean, I'm just plotting the, the all the diagrams together in a, in a dense plot, right? So just put all this um, plot then all on top of each other and color according to density, right? I mean, just so you have an idea of the shape of these di of these diagrams, I guess. Uh, so it, they, they are heavily concentrated <coughs> around here and then sparse far from the. Uh -huh. So you, you combine the persistence diagrams according to different protein types? In this computation, we're combining everything, yes. Okay. Just, um, I guess, I mean, we, maybe a better approach or another approach we could try to take is to focus on one protein type and get a larger data set for that protein type and try to, to predict that, right? That probably would work better. But uh, for now, we are using this small data set, so we're trying to see what happens when you put everything together. Which um, I guess, I mean, maybe not not a good idea. On the other hand, if there are some some uh, general global way in which this energy functional is making mistakes, maybe we may be able to to, to find some information doing this. Right. Right. Um, so then, when you do this, we we'll, we we'll run this linear regression with using all these four hundred proteins, and we use. Uh, use a um, 50 by 50 grid to do this, well, this the grid that we saw, I think, in the previous picture. So then we do this um, persistence, uh, this fitting. So this, we're using the two-dimensional persistence diagrams. So we're using the, the diagrams that measure the, the cavities on the, on, the, on the proteins. And, um, and when you do this, I mean, the linear fitting seems to work, I guess, kind of well in the, in the so this is rigid, this is the L2, regularization um, regulariza with L2 regularization. This is the one with L1 regularization. This one, L2 regularization should give us slightly better results maybe, but this one is not so bad. And they score, so this is like machine learning. So we have this 400 uh, data set. So you, you use 80% of the data set to predict your linear fit and use the, the, the remaining 20% to test if your linear fit is correct. And you do this over several times. And then at each time you do this run, you compute this uh, score, which is essentially how, how well you did, right? And the score of one would be perfect. Close to one is, not, I guess, not bad. So, so then the scores we get are not bad. So it, this is an indication that, um, I mean, the, the, the persistence diagrams are at least apparently capturing something that uh, gives us some information about the, the, the error that we are, we are making, right? In the, in the folding of the protein, right? We are able to, to do a reasonable job with uh, the linear fitting, right? So it means that, uh, <coughs> at least in principle, it seems that we are capturing the information that we want, which is the, the error in the folding that we, we have from the protein, right? <coughs> and um, so then if you look at the dual persistence diagrams, then we, have, we get these two diagrams here. The one on the left is with the L2 regularization. The one on the, on the right is with the L1 regularization, right? So I, as, we, as you know, we expected this is more sparse and this is, there is more regions here, right? And uh, so the idea is um, then to try to, to see, oh, so this is, by the way, is a thresholded, uh, thresholded dual diagram. Again, we, we just plot things that are, we throw away things that are less than 10 to the minus six or seven, I think. So for the regularization, how do you, how do you tune lambda? So lambda is tuned by, by automatically by the, uh, I guess the, the, the software does cross-validation to tune lambda. So, so you, what, what is lambda? So is the, the term in front of the regularization, the regularization, uh, the norm of W, right? So you give, you give the, I'm using this uh, Python skit-learn package. So it, you give it a, a range of lambdas, and it, uh, do, it does cross-validation and find the best lambda for you. So all the other parameters, we, I mean, for now, we, we just played with them and see, I mean, the, the grid size and these kind of things, we, we chose some values and, and 
try to see what works, but lambda is automatically founded by, by the, the, mm, the linear feeding package, right? the machine learning package. Um, right, so then the idea now is if you look at this uh, dual diagram, so it's telling us that these are the regions, especially these high density regions with, with high values or, um, or very negative uh, values. Those are the regions that are more significant to the prediction of the, I mean, assuming that really this prediction is good, this linear fitting is, is doing a good prediction, which seems to be reasonable in the, in the previous plot. So then assuming that this is true, then this, these regions with um, high density, with, with higher values, uh, are, this is telling us that this, so this is the vector W that we're gonna make the dot product with the persistence diagram vector X, and this will give us the error, right? So then the larger values of this or the very small the large negative values of this are the more significant uh, portions of the, the diagrams, right? So then it means that we can somehow identify in the persistence diagram what are the significant regions for the prediction, right? And especially if you look at the L1 uh, regularization term, then you have a very localized to one of these uh, maybe three or four regions here, right? So then the, the idea is, and, and this is essentially as far as we, we went so far, but the idea is, the hope is that um, this will, by looking at these regions, we are gonna, so then if you look at these regions, we should be able to then take this region and see in the, take a protein that uh, it has a, a bad, was a bad prediction, has large error. Then we look at what's the region, the persistence diagram corresponding to this region here. So this will give us what are the regions, the persistence diagram that contributes most to the error. And then by looking at the points in the persistence diagram, we can try to look at the generators that came from, that generate that, uh, that, uh, those features. This will be the simplices on, on, your, on our simplicial complex. And these will be the vertices of this simplicial complex, of the simplices are the atoms of the protein, right? So then with this, I mean, that's the, the idea, we might be able to then go back and say, these are the most significant atoms, the most significant regions in my protein that are contributing to the error, right? If this, I mean, we haven't, I have not yet finished um, doing the, getting the, the generators and, and visualize the generators. And, and, but um, if this really works, then, we, and, and assuming that we get, um, I mean, we don't get things all over the place on, on the proteins. We might be able to find the regions in the protein that that um, are s s contribute most to the error in the in the in the minimization. If if that happens, then this might uh, give us an indication of where the the energy functionals are are making mistakes. Right? So that's the that's the idea of the that's the hope and that's the idea of the what we we plan to do next. And I think that was that was it.